Today, we are diving into the world of invertebrates. How can we tell the difference between groups of invertebrates? Organisms are sorted into groups based on their similarities in a process scientists call classification. Classification helps scientists better understand the tree of life. Think of classification as an inverted pyramid with seven categories. Kingdom is the largest and most broad category. You may have heard of the animal kingdom. That's a great example and includes every single animal on earth. Moving down the pyramid, the categories start to become more specific, eventually ending at the species level. Scientific names of organisms, usually in Latin or Greek, are the combination of the genus and species names. For example, Homo sapiens, commonly known as humans. We will be exploring three different phyla of invertebrates within the animal kingdom that we commonly see in the Tampa Bay estuary, Phylum mollusca, Phylum arthropoda, and Phylum echinodermata. Let's get started. Hi, my name is Sam, and I'm one of the educators here at Tampa Bay Watch. Today, we are gonna to be talking about mollusks. Mollusks are one of the most diverse phyla in the animal kingdom with over 50,000 species. Now to put that in perspective, there are about 5,500 mammals species on this planet, which means there's almost 10 times as many mollusks as there are mammals. That's crazy to think about. So mollusks fill just about every ecological niche on this planet here, all the way from the tops of mountains, all the way down to deep sea hydrothermal vents. Now some of the common mollusks we have include things like octopuses and squid, right? Those ones are really cool. Uh, we get snails, right? Big guys like this horse conch right here. It's very, very large. They can get up to be about, I don't know, almost two feet in length, which is really pretty crazy. We also get clams and oysters, mussels, scallops, you know, things with two shells like we have the common oyster here in our bay. And then we also get things like chitons, just to name a few of those types of mollusks. Now the key features that make a mollusk a mollusk include that they have some soft, squishy body, typically known as a foot. Now we'll use this snail here as an example. If this snail were alive, the soft, squishy body would be right here on the inside. It would feel gooey and slimy. And in the horse conch here, they're bright orange, but those bodies can be speckled or black or brown, all sorts of different colors. So they have a soft, squishy body that's called a foot. They also have some form of a shell, just like our snails wear them on the outside. There are even some shells that are on the inside, like in our squid. And then the last thing is that they are an invertebrate, which is what we're talking about today. And what that means is that these animals do not have a backbone like we do. So there is a, an invertebrate, a mollusk here, that does sort of bend those rules a little bit, and that is the octopus. The octopus actually lacks a shell throughout all of its life stages. There is some evidence to suggest that maybe they did have a shell at one point, uh, but they've actually become so smart and so intelligent that they've actually lost the need for that shell. The first group of mollusks we'll investigate are gastropods, which translates to stomach-footed. They are named so because the soft, squishy part of their body that is visible is where their digestive guts are located. This group includes our snails and slugs. This is a marine snail called the horse conch. You can see their bright orange body located within their strong exterior shell. Shells of snails grow with the organism, and in the case of the horse conch, can reach about two feet in length. Horse conchs and other snails feed using their radula, a mouth structure that scrapes away at their prey, kind of like sandpaper or a cat's tongue. The horse conch is the Florida state shell. The soft, squishy body of gastropods and other mollusks is called the foot because oftentimes this is the main body part used for locomotion. The foot of the lightning whelk is jet black in color, a huge contrast to the bright orange of the horse conch. The shell of the lightning whelk has long, dark brown lines that resemble lightning bolts, presumably how the snail received its name. Also, this whelk's shell is unique because it's considered a left-handed shell, meaning it opens to the left. Most other shells open to the right and are considered right-handed. These large tan spirals, shaped kind of like snakes, are egg casings from the lightning whelk. These casings have many folds capable of containing as many as 100 eggs. Snails have another hard structure connected to their foot called an operculum, which is Latin for covering. You can see it on the salt and pepper body of this crown conch. The operculum helps to lock the snail away when they retreat into their shell to hide from predators or avoid drying out if they get caught on the shore during low tide. The crown conch gets its name from the crown-like spires located at the top of their spiraled shell, making them look like they're wearing an algae-covered headpiece. 
like the crown conch is demonstrating, snails use an extension of their body called a siphon to draw in water over their gills to get oxygen and also to taste the water to find prey. A favorite prey item is their relative, the oyster. So what happens if a snail gets flipped over, maybe by a wave or something? This banded tulip snail is showing off how their muscular foot can aid in orienting themselves upright. By flipping that operculum, the tulip snail can try to tip itself back over. If that doesn't work, the snail can really stretch around its shell to stick itself to the ground, where it can contract its muscles and lift the shell back onto its body. Though not very visible here, the tulip snail has a beautiful smooth shell with dark brown stripes that is often used to make jewelry. The banded tulip snail is carnivorous and enjoys eating other snails found amongst the estuary. Slipper limpets are small one-shelled gastropods, like sea snails, and grow to be about one inch long. Individuals will oftentimes stack up one on top of the other when breeding. Sea hares, like this ragged sea hare, are specialized gastropods with an internalized shell. Most species will inch along the estuary bottom, but in some species, like the Atlantic black sea hare or the mottled sea hare, they use extensions of their foot almost like wings to flutter through the water. Some can even ink, like their cousins, the octopus. Another group of mollusks common to the estuary are bivalves. These are mollusks that have two shells. Oftentimes, bivalves are popular menu items and include clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops. Though some may find them tasty, they are also important for much of the life in our bay. The eastern oyster, for example, is an excellent filter feeder. One single oyster, roughly the size of your ear, can filter up to 50 gallons of water in one single day. As they're filtering the water, they're feeding on plankton and removing debris and detritus from the water, thus making it cleaner. They are also considered a foundation species because as they grow in large communities, they provide shelter and food for many other organisms in the estuary, as well as protecting our coasts from waves and storm damage. This is a juvenile bay scallop. They are usually found nestled in seagrass beds and are easily identified by their 20 pairs of electric blue eyes lining the edges of their shells. Bay scallops are capable of swimming by opening and closing their shells rapidly to generate thrust. Bay scallop populations have been in serious decline in Tampa Bay over the past few decades due to overharvesting during scallop season and coastal development adding sediment to the water, clouding the pristine conditions scallops need in order to thrive. Mollusks are super important for our estuaries and oceans around the world. Many mollusks, like oysters, clams, mussels, even squid, are popular food items in many cultures. Also, their shells make an important home for other animals like hermit crabs, and they also, as they break down, their nutrients get recycled back into the environment. So the next time you're beachcombing or walking along, having a good time, strolling along the shore, consider leaving those shells where you found them, because you never know if an animal might need them. As always, thank you so much for watching. We really, truly appreciate your support. Please visit our website for information on Tampa Bay Watch as well as all of the other fun videos we're gonna be putting out there. Thanks.